How soon will we have robot surgeons? Healthcare has gone fairly remote lately. In reality, most of it is very simple. We're talking video conferencing during COVID. But just a week ago, for the very first time ever, a robot surgeon at John Hopkins University performed abdominal surgery on soft tissue. Now, granted, it was on a pig, not a human. But STAR, or Smart Tissue Autonomous Robot, was a pretty significant success. The question is, how soon will this be available for humans? To chat about it, we have Dr. Tamir Wolf, who's a CEO and co-founder of the surgical intelligence platform, Theater. Welcome, Tamir. Hi, John. Thanks for having me. Hey, it's a real pleasure to have you. Thank you for taking some time here. Um, Give us a scoop. What happened at John Hopkins? Well, it's the first time that minimally invasive surgery was actually performed um, on live tissue. Um, It was a pig. And uh, it was very interesting because they were able to suture the intestines of the pig um, by leveraging the capabilities of autonomous robots. Um, So this was the first time that this has been done. Um, It is predicated on work that uh, was done in 2016 or published in 2016, if I if I believe um, correctly. And it takes us like one step further in the evolution of autonomous robotic uh, surgery. So quite, quite exciting. Now, so this is minimally invasive. So there's a small incision. Instruments are inserted. The operation happens without a large incision happening. And if I'm not mistaken, they picked this because using doing soft tissue, the intestine, that's one of the hardest surgeries to do, right? To stitch that together. Is that correct? Yeah, so there are aspects of dexterity um, and just the ability to take soft tissue um, and suture it. Um, it is, it is difficult. Um, I'd say it's not the most difficult part of a procedure because the most difficult parts of the procedure are actually the cognitive aspects. And I guess we'll talk a bit about that. Um, but I think like from a functional, uh, standpoint of things that surgeons do repetitively, um, during surgery, this is definitely, you know, something that takes us a bit forward. Let's talk a little bit about what it takes what you need to make this happen clearly there's a hardware component there's a software component there's some intelligence required there's a lot more than that as well there's regulation there's ethics what do you all need to make something like this happen so that's a loaded and it's a huge it's a huge question obviously there are so many different aspects to this um i think you know if you take a look at the evolution of robotic surgery um and compare it to what's happening like in the Um, automotive industry, for example, Um, you have various steps uh, from like no automation at all to robotic assistance to partial automations like ADAS, you know, with cars. And then, you know, after that, there are like, you know, conditional automation where the, the vehicle starts understanding like its environment. And then there's the high automation aspects where that's really the decision making process and ultimately full automation. I think where we are today or where like this work at, at Hopkins takes us, you know, forward um, is around like the partial automation aspect. We have um, we have the capability or like this is the initial proof of concept of a capability to automate tasks. And so I think, you know, that's where we are in the evolution of like robotic surgery, which let's face it today is kind of a misnomer because it is actually a human surgeon that's leveraging, you know, a huge device moving a joystick and actually, you know, doing the procedure. So it's not really robotic. And, you know, robots today, they're not that intelligent. Um, and so it, it's the human behind it that, that is intelligent. But as, as more and more functionality transitions to the robot, you know, from that human know-how, then we start tackling a lot of these issues, like the ethical issues, like the regulatory issues, um, like other issues, um, you know, all, all around it. So... Um, I think it's very gradual. I, I think it'll take, you know, quite a bit of time. We've been talking about autonomous vehicles for, I don't know, it seems like ages and that's taking time. Um, and so I think we're moving in the right direction and this is a huge leap, but it's still like small, a small step when we're looking at the broad scheme of things. One thing we chatted about just before we started recording here was who's responsible for a screw up. I mean, 
I remember, I think it was a few months ago, maybe half a year ago, uh, somebody was using the self-driving functionality on their Tesla and they requested the car to come to them. And I think it's called smart summon. You summon your car from the parking lot. It's supposed to show up, you know, and you're kind of like, you step in the chauffeur brought your car, the valet brought your car, you step in and go. And unfortunately <laughs> the car crashed on its way from the parking lot to the pickup spot. And they were going like, Hey, who's responsible? Is Tesla going to cover that? Is my, does my insurance have to cover that? that and who's responsible for a screw up here if the if the robot surgeon messes up it's a great question and i think you know we have at least 10 or 15 years until we have autonomous surgery um and i think you know leading up until then and even then i think there's going to be like a significant component where everything is really supervised by a surgeon um and what the robot does is actually supports the surgeon and a variety of tasks and, you know, hopefully decisions down the road um, that help, um, you know, minimize variability in the way that surgery is performed, because there's tremendous amount of variability today. Um, and using, de using devices and like software like robotic um, surgical equipment, we can actually minimize um, that type of variability. Um, so I think, you know, we're still a long way from robots doing everything on, the, on their own. Um, and so accountability will likely still be with the surgeon who is responsible for performing the operation. This episode is sponsored by Dollar Smart, my creator coin. Yeah, it's crypto. No, it's not a scam. Buy some to support the show, sponsor the show, get weekly rewards as the coin grows, or just to be part of the community at rally.io slash creator slash SM. RT. I think that makes sense. Let's talk about what that time frame looks like. Uh, we've seen autonomous surgeons do stitching, for instance, and uh, theoretically, the, the report is they've outperformed humans at doing that. When do you think we'll start seeing robotic surgery? And we won't call it autonomous, let's say. Let, maybe let's make that two levels, robotic surgery on humans and then autonomous robotic surgery on humans. Do you, do, what do you think is a time frame here? I think it's going to be evolution of like the robotic platforms where initially um, they assist in very discrete, like specific parts of the uh, of the procedure where we need like the surgeon needs to do something that requires like a lot of repetitive motion um, and that, you know, for them might take, you know, a long period of time and be and, and not be as precise as what can be done with a robotic platform. But it'll only be for like specific, in my mind, it'll, it'll only be for specific portions of the procedure. A huge mm -hmm. part of what makes or breaks a procedure um, in the operating room is actually the decision-making process. Um, it's how you interpret things and what you do when you encounter something that just happens. And I think like we're, we're a bit far from that. It's actually, you know, when, you know, it, at theater, we're, we're trying to, you know, start and gather all that, like we call it the surgical intelligence, because it really is the, the brains and the know-how um, that surgeons have today um, that is like scattered all over. And we're trying to like start understanding what that is and codify it so that ultimately one day we'll be able to, you know, just fuel it into the robotic platforms so that there is this cognitive aspect, but it's going to take a bit of time. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's almost like, it's almost like you're saying that uh, every human being is just slightly different and every surgery is just slightly different. I mean, if you talk about robots that are assembling products, each product is exactly the same size and the components are exactly the same dimensions every single time or else there's been a screw up. And if so, then the entire production line is probably shut down, but humans come in different sizes. <laughs> And I suppose that happens inside as well as outside. Definitely. So human come, uh, humans come in different shapes and sizes, and surgeons do too. Surgeons have different capabilities. Um, surgeons, like the way surgery taught today is an apprenticeship model. Every surgeon, even within a specific department today, you know, has different background, has different exposure, has different experiences. And so there is this aspect of variability, and I think this is where... You know, this is the real promise of robotic surgery down the road. You minimize that variability and you're able to actually tackle disparity by understanding like best practices and then leveraging the robotic platform to actually perform in the same way 
but you need to know what best practices look like. And again, that's different between patients, just like you mentioned. How can surgical intelligence, like what your platform provides, uh, feed into the AI and the machine learning that the robotic the, the robots will need? So it's all about the, the data, right? You need to gather like a ton of experiences from around the world um, in order to be able to provide, you know, best practices and like the optimal outcomes, ideally, uh, for a wide, you know, and very, uh, very different patient demographic. And so what we're doing today is actually starting to aggregate that information. Um, and we're gathering experiences of thousands of surgeons, tens of thousands of, uh, uh, of procedures. And the idea is to have like a wide variation uh, there. And by doing so, the idea is to um, leverage the, the power of computer vision and artificial intelligence to not only um, start, you know, analyzing what is going on in the procedure, but derive insights from that. Um, so we basically leverage um, AI to put structure around surgical videos to understand what is going on there. And then we link it to the patient that goes into surgery, to the outcomes postoperatively, and to the surgeon that is performing the procedure. And by doing that, we're like the objective is to really understand what best practices in a specific scenario look like. Um, and then ultimately the idea is to be able to feed that type of logic into the robotic platforms so that when something happens during surgery, um, they can actually tackle it. Because you know, when you're doing surgery, even on a on a on a on a pig. Um, you know, it's one thing, but when you're starting to operate, you know, in, in humans, it's not only about, you know, passing a suture through the gut. It's what happens if when that suture nicks a blood vessel, what does the robot do then? How does it tackle that? Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of decisions and in surgery, um, like one bad decision, it's like a snowball effect. It leads to <laughs> another, another and another. And so the ability to not only identify structures or be able to pass a suture, but actually to think the way that humans think, um, I think is paramount here. And with human surgeons, think about it. It takes decades for them to perfect their craft. It's all about honing in these skills of decision-making. And this is what differentiates a good surgeon from you know, someone who's not as good. Right, right. It, it makes me think, uh, what are some of the worst words you can hear from a doctor or a surgeon, right? And that's odd. Uh, <laughs> is it, are among those? You're under anesthesia. <laughs> Hopefully you're under anesthesia when that's, uh, when that's it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so peer into your crystal ball for us here. Uh, when do you think we will see autonomous surgeons operating on humans, perhaps under supervision, but perhaps not under direct, immediate, one surgeon to one robot supervision? Uh, how long do you think that'll take? I think it'll take a couple of decades at least. I think, uh, you know, it also depends on the space race. Um, because where a lot of this is, you know, might be valuable are like trips to Mars, for example, um, you know, where you can bring a specialist for each and every procedure and you want like, you know, some, someone, or in this case, something that has like tremendous data, um, you know, in the back of their proverbial mind uh, to be able to do things. But I think we're, we're, we, we still have a ways to go. What will that do, assuming we get there, to the availability and cost of healthcare? Like one of the reasons I, um, I founded uh, theater is to tackle variability um, in this space. Like I have a personal story where I diagnosed my wife and my previous boss with appendicitis while living in New York um, within a span of several months. And, and I took him to the hospitals seven miles apart. And the approach to treatment and treatment were very, very different. Uh, with my boss, it was like a near-death experience, even though I brought him already with a clinical diagnosis. Um, and again, one, one error and mistake led to another and complications and protracted stay. And on the other hand, with my wife, luckily for me, 12 hours in and out. And so, you know, this is like New York City. It was 2015 at the time. Um, you know, two hospitals that have amazing, uh, amazing surgeons. So why is that? And, you know, when you think about it, there is tremendous variability because surgery is an apprenticeship. And I mm -hmm. think being able to 
gather all this data, identify best practices and drive them into a platform like this would, would go tremendous, like a tremendous way towards like uh, alleviating variability in the way that, uh, that surgery is performed um, and also allow better access to optimal care um, to huge populations that today um, simply do not, you know, because today, you know, whether we like it or not, there's this notion of like where you live determines if you live um, just because, you know, surgeons are different. And so this is something. And that sometimes we're... there aren't surgeons where you need them to be. Uh, there are entire countries, whether that's India, whether that's other countries in Asia or Africa, uh, even China, um, even frankly, in the United States. Uh, perhaps the, the richest country on, on the planet, there are many locations, rural locations, where you simply don't have access to the doctor, any doctor perhaps, but certainly uh, in many cases, the specialists you need and the surgeons you need. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, there was a recent article uh, that also came out in the New York area that talked about hysterectomy or resection of the uterus and showed that if you're at a higher socioeconomic status, you go to the specialist. And if you're lower socioeconomic status, then you're, you know, you go to the doctors that have less experience in the same healthcare system. And so that is the type of thing that even in the United States, we, I think we're tackling. And I think there's tremendous promise in, uh, in a platform like the surgical robot uh, platforms that we're working towards. Wonderful. I think it is a fascinating future that we're looking towards in healthcare because we have the convergence of so many different things. We've got so much data. We've got intelligence in the form of AI. We've got robotics. We've also got so much data that we're collecting every day from wearables that we're wearing, data that we're collecting from, from apps that we're tracking, what we're eating, apps that are tracking our exercise. And that'll get more and more sophisticated as we go as well, looking at our heart and other vital functions and and certainly this one right now can tell my ox the, the oxygen level in my blood and what are we going to have in five years, right? Is it going to look at blood chemistry on a regular basis? Am I going to get something inserted? Who knows, right? But the AI platforms that are going to be required to synthesize all this data, because frankly, your, your, your general practitioner doesn't want to hear it. <laughs> he or she has way too much going on to get the look at your Apple fitness data or something like that. But synthesizing all that, bringing that to bear in the, you know, on an ongoing basis, but also in the moment when you need specific care, invasive care, um, is good. And, and also the recuperation process after that. Uh, it is a fabulous, amazing, wonderful future that we're working towards. And I want to thank you for this time. Awesome.